Okay. Well, so the first challenge, as I said, it's to pronounce the words so properly because the way <laughs> the list has pronounced it is uh, it's what you saw is you reap what you saw. It's, it's different. <laughs> this is this is not what I'm going to do. But maybe that's what I'm going to do. So first, I'm supposed to give some tell some anecdotes about David. <laughs> uh, well, I've known David well, for only for a very short time, maybe 20 plus years, and. Um, so I, I went to check uh, his uh, Wikipedia page, of course, to, to learn about important facts. And then, uh, so if you read it, uh, this page, you'll know that David is famous for catching the biggest fish in, in one of the lakes, which I know is not true, because David would never go fishing in the lake, with peaceful waters, just not, 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 not interesting. So first time I met David in, uh, in a very cold place in Minneapolis in 1994, at the conference that uh, Misha Schiffman and, and his uh, friends organized there every year, but that was, I think, was the first conference called Continuous Advance, Advances in QCD. And uh, so David arrived there from Australia, where he was fishing for sharks, of course. And <laughs> <laughs> but the biggest shark that he caught was himself. That's, that that much is true. Okay. <laughs> and then. Um, and so then we, we, I got introduced, and eventually David told me that uh, you're not going to stay in Moscow, so you have to go to Princeton and to, 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 to make an honorable man of yourself. And so th eventually I did, but before I came to Princeton, uh, I was asking around people, so what should I, should I go, should I stay? And, and of course everybody told me that, well, Princeton is a fish tank, and, uh, and there is one shark there, but, but everybody else is just uh, you know, down in the food chain. So if you go there, <laughs> <laughs> Your fate is, is, is clear. Of course, there were other people, so, well, one person, whom you can, uh, of course, guess who it was, who said that, no, no, if you are, you know, if you're a real deal, you have to go there and prove yourself. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I went there, and uh, it turned out that David was very busy and uh, very uh, kind to me, so he gave me complete freedom. And he, uh, but he gave me a lot of advice on the most important things the most important things, like uh, you know, whom to date, what to drink. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to take up smoking, but it didn't work out for me, so <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and then he uh, let me sail for a while, and then when I eventually grew up and matured enough, we started working together, which was a very interesting experience, uh, because you would normally think that, well, if you work with your advisor, you will former advisor, you do all the work, and then so he just signs your name, his name on the paper. And with David, it was completely the opposite. So I would do some calculations just to impress David, because everybody knows the only way to impress David is to <laughs> calculate. <laughs> and so it were very complicated formulas. We were trying to solve monopole equations on non-commutative spaces. And, but then the physics was not there. Somehow we wanted to see the monopole string. And it was not there, so, so the energy was not conserved. The whole physics was going down the drain. Mm -hmm. Until one day, David called me and said, well, you know, it was a sign mistake. <laughs> 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 the string was there, but it just was pointing in the opposite direction. <laughs> and so that fixed completely all the problems. And uh, so there is now a string which we both uh, like. And, uh, this development led to other developments, which uh, some of them I will report on today. And uh, so I'm very grateful to for, for all these 20 years and hope for 20 more and more. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> so I'm going to talk about uh, how one can sue <laughs> gauge theories. But before I, I, I tell you about this, I, I will try to explain why this question arises. So uh, this morning I told Nati already this Jewish, Russian Jewish joke about the Jew who, who is dreaming of becoming a king. And so somebody asked him, why would you want to be a king? Well, first of all, I will be a king. But then I can also do a little bit of sewing on the side. <laughs> so, so this is not the reason why I'm going to, <laughs> to do that. So the reason uh, uh, has to do with one of the problems, actually, David is often 
pushing people to think more about. Uh, and it's a, it's a problem of a landscape of vacua in string theory. And uh, so there are different approaches to how to deal with landscape and the approach which I'm trying to, to pursue, pursue in, in some, with some degree of success or, or misfortune, is to find some symmetry or maybe generalized notion of a symmetry which would relate most of this vacuum. So I promised Nati that I will, ex I will also explain the, the something, something about the symmetry and the evolution of the notion of a symmetry. And so that also relates to some advice that David, well, we discussed a lot what, what books we, re we like to read. And so uh, uh, I discovered recently uh, that uh, the notion of gauge symmetry and the gauging of the symmetry has evolved over the years in a way which you wouldn't probably wouldn't recognize. So uh, everybody knows that quarks were called quarks by Gelman because <coughs> he, he found a useful uh, and inspiring term in, in uh, Finnegan's Wake by Joyce. So there were three quarks, and so that was a useful, useful name. But nobody knows that before Joyce uh, wrote Fingon's Wake in 1914, or maybe 1915, or maybe 16, he wrote a book which is called Ulysses, Ulysses which everybody claims have they, they read, but nobody read, actually. <laughs> because, <laughs> and here's the proof. In the next to last episode, so the Ulysses is a story of a guy, and there are three main characters, two, two men and one woman. And so he goes through Dublin and uh, has all kinds of experiences. And so in the next to last episode, he, sh he shows a picture of his wife to, to his friend. And uh, what he's doing while watching this picture is gauging the symmetry. That's, that's what Joyce writes. Gauging the symmetry of her, and then I will not mention because I'm on record, <laughs> so, <laughs> if you're a physicist, you can decipher. Of course, Joyce, you have to decipher. Uh, one speaks about probably either Z2 symmetry or <laughs> U1 symmetry. It's a global symmetry. Well, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and gauging, in the Joyce sense of the word, is not gauging in, 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 in the way we use this, this term now. It's certainly not. <laughs> it's not redundant. <laughs> okay, so um, back to gauge theories. So now in the modern sense of the word. Um, so the question, um, which eventually leads to this question about the symmetries relating uh, different vacua, different classical solutions, in the absence of the obvious symmetry in the standard way of sense of the word, like a symmetry of Lagrangian, uh, I was interested uh, for a while in the uh, in finding the uh, natural set of observables, local observables in gauge theory. So what do I mean by natural? <laughs> well, let's start with the simplest gauge theory that David, again, famously worked on. And, and uh, also, there was a piece of advice about that topic. So if you get a good result, the first thing to do, you organize a conference. <laughs> <laughs> so, the f okay, so let's start study the matrix model, the simplest. Uh, let's say one matrix model, n over n by n Hermitian matrices, with a polynomial potential. And the observable, which, so the first set of observables which you normally would consider would be the single trace operators, which you can organize into the generating function, which Nadav already used today. Uh, maybe one of the X, which is also known as a resolvent. So there's no minus here. And there is no Sorry. Just that. So if M is a classical matrix, this is some function of X which has poles at the eigenvalues of M. So if you know this function, you know the spectrum of the matrix. Now when M becomes a fluctuating variable, 
with, with this measure, it, it, r of x is some kind of random function uh, with complicated singularities. And if you do the large n limit, and uh, so this is the trace in n dimensional representation, let me normalize it in this way. Uh, then it turns out that, so in the large n limit, r becomes, a, again, a classical <coughs> function, some master, fu master field. So r gets a cut. May have several cuts, but let's, let's assume it has a single cut. Uh, sorry, uh, it may have several cuts depending on, on the polynomial. Uh, so it has cuts. Mm -hmm. And the uh, feature of this uh, function is that it jumps across the cut in a rather simple fashion such that if you introduce another function, let me call it y of x, and maybe there is some i somewhere, this function simply changes sign when you cross the cut. So the natural observable in this case is the square of this shifted resolvent. Because it has, uh, it turns out has, it has no singularities. In X, and so if, da is, if V is a polynomial function, then by symptotics of infinity, you can conclude that it is a polynomial. And so from this, you can solve the theory, this model in the large and limit, and then try to do systematic corrections. <coughs> so what about high dimensional theories? Is there an analog of the, the way of, of such a way of organizing observables, which, uh, oh yes, I forgot to say. So the, the fact that this y changes sign this is actually the beginning of a beautiful story, namely uh, if instead of the single matrix model, you can see the quiver matrix model where you have matrices <coughs> at each vertex of a, of a quiver, and there is an interaction. So in addition to the sum of the single uh, node potentials, there is also the interaction term. So this type of quiver is the A-type quiver, but there are other possible possibilities. It turns out that um, so you will have not, not one, but several resolvents for each matrix. It turns out that this transformation <coughs> generalizes to wild group action. Uh, so it's a, it's a wild group of the Lie group whose Dinkin diagram is this quiver. And so you can, uh, so the natural observables are the polynomials of these y's, which are violent variant, most also known as characters. Okay, so uh, this is as much as I can say about the matrix model. This is uh, something we observed with Peston a long time ago, but somehow didn't publish yet in the violation of another Famous advice, if you <laughs> have a result, publish it. <laughs> yes? What was the thing that you have about the potential? What form does it take? It's a polynomial. It has to be a polynomial. Well, polynomial. Any, Any polynomial. Any polynomial. So the, 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 the degree of this polynomial will determine the degree of this polynomial. And then the... the uh, so uh, what I want to talk about today is... Uh, uh, it's a similar story in four-dimensional gauge theories, uh, theories with supersymmetry, so that uh, the exact computations are possible. And uh, so since everybody today was talking about n equals two theories <laughs> in four dimensions, I will talk about n equals two theories in four dimensions. Uh, so in four dimensions, yeah, the vector multiplet of n equals two contains a scalar, so it's a complex, 
scalar in the adjoint. And so you can view the scalar as a matrix, and so try to, to define the resolvent like this for this matrix. But it turns out that it's more interesting, more useful to, to uh, define a kind of exponentiated version of this resolvent. And so let me call the y to be x to the n. So then we can talk, talk about your gauge theory. <coughs> so now I do have 1 over k. And so again, by repeating the exercise that Nadav did uh, this morning, classically, this is just the characteristic polynomial of the of this uh, scalar phi. But quantum mechanically, uh, because of non-perturbative effects, the algebra of Casimir's gets corrections. And so this is not, this is not, no, it's not a polynomial of x, turns out, plus corrections. So what type of corrections? Um, no, no, this is not large n. This is finite n. This is this is finite n. Okay. Ah, but then determinant is a finite uh, dimension polynomial. Right? So the classical. So this is this is a degree n polynomial. But yeah. but but I said there are corrections. So these corrections have one over x in, in them, and so this is actually in an instant on background. So y of x is uh, actually a rational function. By y of x, you mean the expectation value of this? Well, as an operator, yes, the expectation value. Yeah, I guess I guess I want to talk about the expectation value. A rational function of x of degree n. So it has poles. It has zeros and poles. And number of zeros is n greater than the number of poles. OK, so uh, now if we subject, subject this theory to the omega background, which is already mentioned, was mentioned by Zahar, uh, to sort of reduce the gauge theory partition function to a kind of a statistical mechanical model, okay. then. Sorry, yeah. Something stupid. Yes. Uh, just classically, if I equate the bottom and the top, it would look like the top of some ends at n. No, no. So, so you see, this is exponent, exponential. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Now, this is exactly the computation that Nadav was doing, so you should have asked. <laughs> All right. So uh, now, there are several things which uh, I, I, I did to the n equals 2 theories over, over the years to, to make them calculable. And so one is this omega deformation, which has two parameters, the omega background. which has two parameters, epsilon 1 epsilon 2, which have to do with the uh, two uh, independent rotations of, you know, of four-dimensional Euclidean space-time you can perform. And another is non-commutativity. So non-commutative non -commutative R4. So this is to regularize the uh, small size instanton uh, behavior of the moduli spaces of instantons. So this is actually the, pro so in the, in the, in the Haar's talk, there was some discussion of uh, difficulty of uh, dealing with SUN gauge theories as opposed to UN gauge theories. And that has to do with the fact that on non-commutative spaces, SUN doesn't make sense. It's only the UN. Um, because, basically because, uh, first of all, you cannot impose conditions point-wise on non-commutative space. You have only global conditions involving traces Trace is like an integral of all of a space. And so you cannot say that trace of a matrix vanishes pointwise. So uh, in, in this game, one usually performs the computations for UN theory, and then performs the, for the U1 theory, and then divides one by another. And so that sometimes gives a good hint of what is the SUN answer. Sometimes you have to work harder, if, especially if you have high, high Casimir's. So anyway, so if you do this, and the uh, omega deformation parameters are not rationally related, for simplicity. 
So this building hosts the Institute for Study of Rational Rationality. So this is <laughs> this is a very <laughs> so the upper, floor. upper floor. Okay. So we are not there yet. So let's first start with irrational case. Irrational is simpler. Simpler. Um, so the instantons, which are supersymmetric with respect to the uh, uh, supersymmetry preserved by omega background, are combinatorial objects. So these are collections of Young diagrams, arbitrary Young diagrams. So there are n Young diagrams whose only restriction is that the total size is equal to the instanton charge. So on such a background, this function y has uh, zeros which correspond to the corners at which you can add a box to Young diagram. So y is a product of x minus something which is associated with the, to the box which you can add. And in denominator, it has contribution of, uh, it, it's a product of the terms which correspond to the boxes which can be removed from the Young diagram. So here you actually already can start seeing that there is some structure to this to this instant of solutions, which just given an instant of solution, it, it the solution itself tells you how you can you can modify it to produce another solution. Namely, you take this function y of x, this observable, you look at its zeros, and that those tell you where you can add the box and go from the instanton charge k to k plus one. So that's like moving up. So zeros. They, they, they increase the charge, and poles decrease the charge. So you can remove one box to them. So uh, using this observation, you can ask the following question. Is there a, a combination of y's, of, of these y observables, for which the poles will cancel? And the answer is yes. So. Uh, So this is the analog of the uh, taking the square of the resolvent in the, in the matrix model case. So what combination you should take depends on the gauge theory. So if you take the, let's say, the UN theory with an F equals to N uh, hypermultiplets, fundamental hypermultiplets, then this combination is very simple. So this is the instant on. counting parameter. And this is the, so this is a polynomial <coughs> which determines the masses of the, uh, of quarks. And so this is the whole, the whole expression. It's y plus one instanton correction, one over y. So if you look at this expression, y has poles and the poles are, as we said, at the boxes which can be removed. And the, the residue at, at such a pole is compensated by the contribution of the, of the pole of this expression, which occur when y has zeros, which are the boxes which can be added. And so there is a piece, so there is a, uh, the, uh, the instant partition function organizes into pairs of instant solutions which differ by adding or removing one box. And the residues cancel among, uh, between these pairs. So different residues cancel between different pairs. But you see there is some structure. Now, so there is a landscape of uh, this, the space of instant solutions. You can view it as a model of landscape. These are discrete solutions, isolated, because the omega deformation acts as a, some kind of a flat background. You have a landscape of solutions, but they are not independent. So you can pass from one to another. Uh, in the multi multitude of ways. So this is a generalization of a, of a notion of symmetry beyond what Joyce meant and, and what we, we mean now. Um, representation of phi field. As you draw it, it looks more or less arbitrary, right? Taking, uh, 
So, so Young diagrams, they are, these are, these are the uh, classical solutions of Young, of, of, um, uh, of super Young Mills theory. So actually of Young Mills theory. And the picture, I mean, look at this picture, you can, you can fi uh, I will tell you what are the eigenvalues of phi in the, for the solution. Phi is an adjoint. It's a, it's a, it's a scalar in the vector multiplet. It's a vector multiplet scalar. So we're discussing the chiral ring okay. of unequals to theory on the Coulomb branch. So this is, these are the apparatus that Zohar was discussing this morning. So um, <coughs> the partition function, so this, uh, so this partition function, which depends on the, the uh, the Coulomb parameters, which are the, the, the VEF, the naive VEF of this field phi, and of the omega deformation parameters, and of the gauge coupling, and of the masses. So this is the sum. It's a sum over all these uh, uh, antiples of partitions. And so there is a, there is a contribution of each, each configuration. And the claim is that if you insert this observable into the sum. So the, now the, the average with respect to this measure of this observable is a polynomial in X. Well, now you can use this fact. Namely, when you look at the left-hand side and expand in X near X going to infinity, you get lots of negative terms, which will which know about something about the geometry of these young diagrams. They involve expectation values of various Casimirs. But the right-hand side doesn't have negative powers in X. So you have an infinite number of water identities, or I call them non-perturbative dyson schwinger identities, which, uh, well, which follow from this uh, quote symmetry, uh, changing the instanton charge by one. You can generalize these observables to study more general, I mean, you, you, you don't have to insert one Y, you can have several Ys. And so there is a whole uh, tower of such expressions. They, um, so this expression, it's a deformation of an SO2 character. So if you look at, at this combination from far away, you see y plus 1 over y. And so this is like a trace of the trace of a matrix whose determinant is equal to 1. And that's because this theory, which I started with in some classification, it's the A1 type theory. So it has the, there is a one gauge group, and the, well, the matrix is only in the fundamental representation. Again, this can be generalized to any quiver theory. And then uh, the, these expressions become more involved, and they, they deform the characters of, of the corresponding Lie algebras. Thank you. So, OK, so these expressions you got by trial and error, by canceling the poles. But is there an underlying reason why such an expression is natural? And so the answer turns out to be, uh, well, you, OK, I will skip the, the, the intermediate steps. So it turns out that. The, the interpretation of these expressions is the following. Imagine you realize your gauge theory is a theory on the stack of D3 brains. So let's say we, we live in 0, 1, 2, 3 dimensions. And then, uh, so this is type 2B string. Now, no, if you don't do anything, this will be n equals 4 theory. But I want to, I want to have n equals uh, 2. So that means that there are four transverse dimensions. Uh, let me call them uh, six, seven, eight, nine, which you somehow you should do something to them to, to break part of supersymmetry. And then there, are, there is another two dimensions, which are, so this is four, five, which are the positions of these, of these three brains, which are the Coulomb parameters, A1, AN, of, uh, of our theory. So it turns out that this, uh, this combination of y's, which I uh, propose here, is actually a partition function of, of a combined theory. 
So you, you take another stack of brains, W D3 brains, which live in this transfer space, six, six, six seven, eight, nine. So uh, this theory, I omega deformed with parameters epsilon 1, epsilon 2. This theory has its own uh, two independent rotational symmetries. So there are parameters epsilon 3, epsilon 4, which have to sum up to 0. And uh, so, so now on this additional two-dimensional plane, which is transverse to both stacks of brains, <coughs> We now have two sets of points. Let's say we have A1, AN, which were the uh, positions of horizontal brains, and let's say B1, BW, which are the positions of the, of the vertical brains. So these two stacks of brains, they're separated. There is some center of mass separation, which is x. So this x variable of the, the argument of this function is actually separation of these brains in the, in the transfer space. So now, uh, here is the explanation for why there are no poles. So it turns out that, and first of all, the explanation why there are several terms in this expression. That's because the instantons, the, uh, our four-dimensional gauge theory instantons, now are shared between our theory, our space, our space-time, and this phantom space-time. And so they can, if, if they, uh, so if, if all these brains are separated in the transfer space, well, they're stuck. They, they move along the brains. There is no interaction. But if you adjust x in the, in the, certain, in the, sign, in the way that two of these uh, points uh, coincide, so then physically there is an intersection of brains, then the instanton can cross over from one brain to another. And that's crossing over, uh, well, takes some modular space, actually. So the modular space is modified. So there is a, actually a little two-sphere worth of modular describing the instantons, which, which is sitting at the intersection and thinking, should I go left, should I go up, should I stay, should I go? So there is a whole two-dimensional sphere worth of, of modular for that. And the integral over this two-dimensional sphere is always in localization, becomes a sum of two contributions. And so these two contributions are the contributions of two uh, uh, sets of Young diagrams which differ by one box. So this box, which we removed from one, one uh, one of our space-time instantons actually went and into the instantons on, on, on this uh, uh, phantom theory. So let me finish by describing the, the solutions in this combined theory because I, I, I think there is a good name for them. So our instantons these are young diagrams which grow in the directions epsilon 1, epsilon 2 and the instantons, the phantom instantons, they grow in directions epsilon 3, epsilon 4, which sort of grow in opposite direction because this is condition. And if you adjust these Coulomb parameters, at some point they start overlapping. And so when they overlap, they describe configuration which I call the butterfly. So some of these boxes become uh, uh, common to both sets. And uh, so there is some linear combination of vectors which is involved, which is parameterized by this two sphere, and more, more, gen uh, more generally by, by high dimensional projective space. Now, uh, once you start thinking about these theories on the stacks of brains, which, which so the, there are fields which describe the ordinary gauge theory on, 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 on the vertical world volume. There are fields which describe the was in the gauge theory on our world volume. But there are also some fields which come from open strings stretched between them, which connect one to another. And so there are additional degrees of freedom which are localized at the intersection point, which happen to be fermionic degrees of freedom, whose int when you integrate them out, when you integrate out fermions, you produce something in the numerator. And that's the, that's the naive determinant of x minus phi, which you get in the, in the classical limit of this formula. Am I completely out of time? OK, I'll stop here. <laughs> Questions or so I'm not completely sure if I understood this W parameter means that this X becomes a matrix so No no so so this this is this was what W equals yeah. one, this yeah. is fundamental. So you can you generalize so there is will be a product of several things like X plus B one, X plus B two, 
x plus bw, and so on. Let me finish by thanking the organizers for inviting me, giving me the opportunity to talk here, and to placing me just next to Jeff, because Jeff has a, such a great sense of humor that whatever I said will be completely <laughs> <laughs> erased by Jeff's <laughs> jokes. Please. Thanks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, You're not off the hook that easy. Okay. <laughs> Yes, so, so, uh, so this discussion was actually in the case of irrational. When the ratio of epsilons becomes irrational, things become a little bit more complicated. Uh, one thing, so it now it depends whether the ratio is positive rational number or negative rational number. If it is positive, which is the case, for example, for the sphere partition functions, where it's actually equal to 1, then uh, it turns out that the contribution of individual partitions uh, in this measure, which I erased, is uh, singular. There are poles. But the whole expression is non-singular. So instead of the sum, you actually get integrals. So there are some compact varieties in the modular space which you have to integrate over. The expressions have become more complicated. And from the point of view of the irrationals, are there several classes of irrationals? No, that's uh, as, as no, the only rationality is, is, is important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Transcendentality is not important. Can I ask a quick, quick yes. question? Yes. My task is to calculate the chiral ring of the joint traces, right? And I am this Jew who is aspiring to become a king. Yeah. In which sense I am suing me? In, in this case, so, what do I saw? So the, you saw the following. So you, you added to the UN gauge theory in, in, in the physical space time, you add U1 gauge theory in the unphysical transfer space time. And, when, and then you integrate it out. You integrate it out. So when you integrate it out, you produce an observable which, is, which probes the physics of our space time. Okay? Now, by the theorem which I just formulated, the result, I mean, the result is complicated as, as, as a function of many parameters, but as a function of this x, basically the separation of this extra brain from the cloud of our brains in the transverse R2, the result is a polynomial. And so that's a powerful result. So, for example, if you remove epsilons, so go back to the, f to the theory without omega deformation, this formula becomes classical formula. So there is no expectation value. And this formula becomes just the expression for the zabi curve. So I just derived for you the zabi curve in one line. And that, so that which is, which is the, I mean, which contains all the information about the Kyle, Kyle ring, actually. Yes. Then that's the formula which you get. Right. But in order to get it efficiently, you have to sue something. Right. But also, it's it's. I mean, once you learn how to make stitches of one type, you can you can uh, improvise. And so, <laughs> uh, you discover that, for example, you can study configurations of brains which intersect not at a point but on a, along a two-dimensional defect. Uh -huh. And so, so this in this story, the, this. Uh, considerations allow you to prove all the you know all the consequences of the AGT conjecture for example you can prove that the BPZ equation and the KZ equation are obeyed by the correlation functions of, of n equals two in four dimensions for the ordinary uh, uh, for the Euler theory or for W symmetric theories but now if you study the the brains configurations brain configurations which overlap or along a two-dimensional surface you will discover something which I wouldn't have uh, you know, imagined before that there is a super current algebra symmetry living there. So current algebra for the super al for the super Lie algebra. So if you have the stack of n brains and m brains sharing a two-dimensional surface, there is S U N slash M hidden there, which is uh, not trivial. Okay, so now to the moonshine. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Uh,